antidepressants or anxiolytics, or they are drugs like alcohol or some of the prototypic drugs of abuse, which would include alcohol. Okay, structure and function of the nervous system. Y'all may not care, but I got to share a handy little tip with you, something I came across. Notice this little voice thing on this page? I just cut the corner off of a, you can cut the corner off an envelope, this one came off the, this is the corner off of a folder. But it makes the handiest little bookmark. You just slip it over the corner, and when you want to find where you're at in the book, it's easy to find. You don't have to dog ear the page. I'm thinking about seeing if this little thing's been patented. Patented. Yeah, and see if I can make some money off of it. <laughs> so maybe make it out of plastic instead of... What do you think, Cheyenne? I think it's a great idea. Off. It's an empty idea. You could have all sorts of designs. And yeah, you could make it all different colors. You yeah. could put designs on it. What do you think, Gabby? We do them at the library, but uh, we do them at the library, but yeah, you can do it. Would you buy some if they were available? Uh, probably. probably. I mean, they have pictures of Dr. Harlan on them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just thought it was a neat idea. Okay. Not everybody has to be as impressed with it as I am. Now, we could spend... I didn't bring it with me, but I think the next test is over two chapters, if I remember right. And we could spend easily, or I could spend easily, far more time on those two chapters than we really have to devote to them in this class. So I want you guys to help me not do that. Should be a review for you in terms of the material that we're going to cover because everything I'm going to talk about here we've already talked about in physiological. But I realize that not everybody is like Tyler and remembers everything we talked about in physiological. <laughs> goals I want to accomplish in the next two chapters are to just review the structure and function of the nervous system and to review how the nervous system is able to generate and, and uh, transmit signals and also uh, the event or the processes involved in the generation and transmission of those signals, including both what happens within the neuron and what happens between nerve cells when they are transmitting signals. But let's begin with, in this chapter, are these are the primary topics we're going to cover. The cells of the nervous system, electrical transmission within a neuron, and organization of the nervous system. Before I start going over those, notice number two, it says electrical transmission within a neuron. So that indicates, and you should remember, that
that transmission of a signal within a neuron is an electrical process, and that your nervous system functions in large part on electricity. Now, let me just ask a question before we're going to get to it later on, and that is, what the process of transmission of a signal across between neurons is what kind of a process? Is it electrical or is it something else? If one cell is communicating with a second cell, is that an electrical process or is that a different kind of process? Not electrical. Okay, don't worry about stem cells. We're not going to worry about um, the... Uh, where I want to start is to start with uh, just some comments about the, the cells of the nervous system. And there are two types of cells found within the nervous system in two general categories. One is neurons, or nerve cells. And a review question, what's the other type of cell that's found within the neuron, within the nervous system? Sensory? Sensory? Glia cells? Sensory? Glia cells. Glia cells? Glia cells is G-L-I-A. Glia cells are even more numerous than the neurons are. But some general terms you need, 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 do need to be familiar with. Sensory neurons are specialized neurons that are able to convert physical stimulation into electrical signals. What are these electrical signals called? potentials? <laughs> okay. So a sensory neuron can respond to, to stimulation and produce action potentials, which are the language that the nervous system can understand. For example, there are receptors in your eyes that respond to light and when light stimulates these receptors, they produce action potentials, which are then sent to the brain, where you can interpret that stimulation. Motor neurons, on the other hand, are neurons that send signals away from the nervous system out to the periphery of the body so that you can respond to stimulation. For example, motor neurons are neurons that do exactly what the name implies, and that is they allow for voluntary motor behavior or, or voluntary movements. So sensory is carrying information in towards the, the central nervous system. Motor neurons are carrying information away from the central nervous system. Now, again, a review question. There are... Uh, um, other terms that are used to commonly to refer to sensory and motor neurons. Do you remember what those terms are? Apparently not. Apparent and efferent. Remember that? Apparent being sensory, efferent being motor. And then the third general category mentioned here is interneurons. These are found within the brain and the spinal cord. And um, actually, it's the interneurons that do a lot of the processing of information within the nervous system. But they're called interneurons because they're often found in a pathway between the sensory and motor neurons. Okay. <clears throat> now we're going to be talking about nerve cells 
as if there were a prototypic nerve cell. But what I want to point, and to some extent, it's fair to say that most nerve cells share common characteristics or common features. And because of that reason, we are going to be using a particular type of nerve cell to illustrate the structure of a neuron. But I do want to point out that neurons are not all the same in terms of their structure. I mean, these are just some examples. Look at, there's five examples here. Three of them are found in the retina of the, the retinas of the eyes. And those are the three at the top. Bipolar cells, retinal ganglion cells, and amacrine cells. Two of the three you should remember from physio, or at least they should ring a bell. But notice even in those specialized cells within the retinas of the eyes, there are differences in the way they're, they are put together. Look at the lower left, you see a cortical pyramidal cell. A cortical pyramidal cell is found in the cerebral cortex. But it looks quite different than the others. And then if you look at the cerebellar Purkinje cell on the right, that one looks even more different than the other. But one of the things that you'll see in um, all of the cells except one that are on this illustration is that the features common to all of them are dendrites, a cell body, and an axon except for the amicant cell. You don't see an axon or an amicant cell. But most of the neurons have each of these three features. And one of the things I also want you to notice about this is that on the cells that have axons, there's only one axon per cell. But look at the dendrites. Here, they're very limited, but as you look at the different cells, particularly compare this one to that one, look at the extensive dendritic branch, branching of this cell. That's pretty complex. And when you think about the fact that each of those dendrites is communi communicating with other cells in the, nerve, in the brain or the nervous system, it kind of gives you the ability to visualize just how many interconnections there are between cells in the nervous system. And it gives you an, an idea of the complexity of the nervous system. It's probably, in my opinion, it's the most complex organ in the human body, or the body of any other animal. Okay, let's just talk briefly about those uh, characteristics of the cell that I just identified. The soma is a, just another name for the cell body. It contains the cell nucleus and other organelles. Organelles is just a generic term that refers to a variety of different structures found within the cell body. And we're not going to go into a lengthy discussion of all of those other structures. But I do want you to be aware of the fact, if you're not already, that it's the nucleus that contains the genetic makeup of the cell. And it's the cell body that carries out most of the life sustaining functions of the cell. And if you damage the cell body or destroy the cell body, that cell is going to die. Now the dendrites are projections from the soma and they receive information from other neurons. They're going to be picking up signals from other nerve cells and conducting those signals in towards the cell body. The axon is an extension that conducts an electrical signal from the cell body out to the terminal projections of the axon or to the terminal.
terminal buttons of the axon. And the, this illustration uh, is able to depict what we just got through talking about. Here's the cell body with the nucleus contained within it. You have multiple dendrites extending out from it, each of these receiving signals from other neurons. And then you see a single axon coming out. But you'll notice that the axon may branch out here. This one extends out a ways before it uh, forms two branches. Each of the branches terminates in what are referred to as terminal buttons. The terminal buttons are where the neurotransmitters are stored that allow the cells to communicate with each other. Now, look, this, this is the prototypic neuron I was talking about that we're going to use to discuss structures of a neuron. Actually, this is a motor nerve cell or a motor neuron. Uh, sensory neurons would look a little different, kind of like the uh, retinal cells we looked at in the previous illustration. But for discussion purposes, the motor neuron is a good one to illustrate the structural features. Now, there's a portion of the cell body right here that's labeled the axon hillock. Cheyenne, tell me what you remember, if anything, about the axon hillock. I just remember that that's where the axon connects to the, the cell body or okay. whatever. It is. But there's a very important process that goes on at the axon hillock. Oh. Isn't that where there's like passive diffusion? Is that where, I'm trying to think of what it's called. Isn't that where like the higher concentration moves to lower concentration? Well, yes, but that also occurs other places. I mean, in fact, that what you're talking about is one of the processes that's going to occur uh, when generating a, an action potential, which is going to travel from the axon hillock down the length of the axon to the axon terminus. The, what I want you to try to remind you folks of concerning the axon hillock is that this is the decision maker of the cell. This is where all the signals that are being picked up by the dendrites and carry in towards the cell body, this is a point at which they're going to be added together or summated, and the, deter the decision is made as to whether or not this cell will generate an action potential or it won't. There's your decision maker right there. I mean, I'm going to refer to it as the decision maker, but that's where the summation of all the signals occurs because if you remember some of the signals that the cell is receiving are excitatory, some are inhibitory. And somehow the cell has to be able to add those together to determine whether the overall effect is going to be excitation or inhibition. And if it's excitation, it generates an action potential. If it's inhibition, it doesn't. And just remember that Inhibition plays just as an important role, if not a more important role, in the nervous system than excitation does. Okay. Then a few other features I want to mention about this diagram. Um, notice that on the axon, at least on this particular nerve cell, you have the axons um, surrounded by a sheath referred to as a myelin sheath, which is, myelin is a fatty substance that is found in segments on a variety, on many of the neurons in the nervous system. Not all neurons will have the myelin sheath, but one of the things you'll notice is that the myelin sheath is arranged in segments, and that there is a small gap between these segments referred to as the nerve of Rondia. Another review question. If 
if a cell has a myelinated axon, then that cell will, will transmit a signal faster or slower than a non-myelinated axon. Faster. Slower. Any other? Faster. 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 Do you remember why? We're going to cover that before we're done. We won't go into it right now. In fact, now that I've mentioned that, there are two factors that influence the rate of transmission of the signal. One is if, whether it's myelinated or not. It's myelinated, faster transmission. What's the other factor I've identified before that influences how fast the signal will travel? Probably a good thing we're reviewing all this kind of stuff, huh? The diameter of the axon. The larger the diameter, the faster the signal. So those two factors are the primary factors that influence speed of transmission. Diameter of the axon and the presence of myelin. Okay. Continuing our look at the neuronal features, when the axon does branch, these branches are referred to as axon collaterals, which as you can see, when they get out to the distal portion of it, branch out fairly extensively. At the end of each of these branches are tiny structures called terminal buttons. The terminal buttons contain the neurotransmitters that are, will allow that cell to communicate with uh, other cells. So those are the things that I would expect you to know about the structure of a uh, typical or as typical a neuron as we have. This is talking about some stuff you need, don't need to worry about. The organelles within the cell body and the production of energy within the cell body, we're not going to uh, deal with that. I've just given you an overview of that information that's contained on pages 42 through 
that is labeled here as oligodendroglia. The term I use for that is oligodendrocytes. But the Schwann cells in the central nervous system are formed by oligodendrocytes. The Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system, I mean, no, I'm sorry, the myelin in the central nervous system is formed by oligodendrocytes. The myelin in the peripheral nervous system is formed by glia cells that are called Schwann cells. Does anybody remember that poor attempt at humor I used in physio as a hint to how to, how to remember Schwann cells peripheral and oligodendrocytes central? It was a chronor. Remember I used the analogy of the Schwann man and the Schwann trucks? You have ambulatory neurons in the periphery driving around long distance and stopping and knocking on the door of neurons and asking if going to buy a pie or some frozen food. Yeah, it's cheesy. But for some people, it helps them remember that those are found in the peripheral nervous system. Years ago, my, my parents used to buy stuff from the Swan people. I haven't done that in years. Do they have good food? Good stuff? You no. Know? We used to get it, but it was good. Well, I've seen the trucks around Goodwill. I've never stopped one and said, give me a catalog or sell me something, but maybe I should. Okay. One of the, the primary thing I want you to notice here is that it, this just illustrates the fact that the Schwanza or the myelin is wrapped around the axon in concentric circles. That's just a cross section through, a, through an axon. You see it illustrated here with surrounding layers of the glia cells which form the mind. Over here you get a better look at the node of Ranvier that occurs between the sections of mind. That's really all I want to use that illustration. And here is it's pointing out something I already pointed out, and that is the myelin sheet increases the speed of conduction along the axon. The thicker the myelin, the faster the conduction. And also, what I said about the um, uh, diameter of the axon. Okay, we're not going to deal with all that. Or that. For that, unless Cheyenne, you want to explain this to us? No, thanks. Okay. Abby, you want to explain that? I think I'll pass. Huh? I think I'll pass. Thank you, though. Okay, just be that way. But we're not <laughs> going to talk about gene expressions and all that kind of stuff. We're not even going to go into the details of uh, axoplasmic transfer. So that kind of information you don't have to worry about. Okay, one of the things I do want to talk about while we're talking about the uh, structure of neurons, This would be related to information on page 49 and 50 and 51. Remember that each cell in the body is surrounded by a what? What forms the outer wall of every cell in the body? What's that called? cell wall or cell membrane. Now, with 
as far as the nervous system is concerned, one of the things I want you to remember is that in the cell membrane, which is composed of a lipid bilayer, there are specialized proteins in, embedded within that lipid bilayer. Some of those specialized proteins are receptor proteins. And these are the sites at which many of at which neurotransmitters, hormones, and drugs can bind to produce their effects. And most of the receptors that we're going to be talking about are receptors that are embedded within the cell membrane. Now with hormones, the receptors are often found within the cell. But we're primarily talking about um, membrane receptors here. And these other, other proteins do other jobs. For example, um, some of these proteins that are embedded within the cell membrane form ion channels that allow ions to pass back and forth across the membrane. And some of the ions that we're going to be concerned or that we're going to be most interested in in, the, in this chapter and the next chapter are potassium, sodium, chloride, and calcium. Pay attention and know the symbols for each one. Potassium is K with a single plus sign indicating that it carries a single positive charge. Sodium is Na with a uh, single plus sign indicating that it carries a single positive charge. Chloride, Cl minus, a single negative charge, and calcium, Ca2 plus, carries a double electrical charge, or double positive charge. But know the symbols both because you just need to know that, and the fact that when you're taking notes, it's a whole, a whole lot easier to write K plus than it is to write potassium or it ain't plus than the right sodium. But these ions, as if you'll remember, and if you don't remember, I'll remind you, form the underlying basis of the electrical processes within the nervous system. thing I want to point out here concerning these ion channels is that with most of them, when the cell is at rest, the ion channel is closed. But when stimulated, or when the neurotransmitter binds to the uh, receptor on the ion channel, the ion channel changes its configuration and will open to allow ions to move back and forth. But th there are two general categories. There are ligand-gated channels and there are voltage-gated channels. A ligand-gated channel opens when a ligand binds to a receptor. What's a ligand refer to? That refers to any substance that can bind to the, to the receptor to produce an effect. Here we're talking about neurotransmitters or in some cases we're talking about drugs that bind to the receptor. Voltage-gated channels are, whether they open or not, is determined by the electrical potential that exists across the membrane at that point in time. For example, when the voltage difference gets to a certain amount, this will cause a voltage-gated channel to open up. And when it reaches a different level, it causes the voltage-gated channel to close. So some channels are activated by binding of a ligand. Others are activated by differences in electrical potential. And this is just showing you an example of a ligand-gated um, channel. Here's the specialized 
protein that forms the ion channel. Here's the receptor site on that ion channel. The neurotransmitter or drug binds to the receptor, and when it does, it causes this to happen. Notice how the channel is now open. And now that it's open, the ions can pass from one side of the membrane to the other. Now here's a situation illustrating a voltage gate check. And notice here we've got a situation where you know, here's the lipid bilayer, here's the ion channel embedded in it. Notice the difference in voltage at this point. It's positive on the outside, negative on the inside, and the channel is closed. The cell is stimulated. Now the charge has changed to negative here compared to the inside, and now the channel is open. So you can see it's a function of the difference in charge across the membrane as opposed to the binding of a receptor, or a binding to a receptor. And it's fair to point out that in some of these cases, and this is where it can get really complex. Um, in some cases, what will happen is that when this channel is activated, it will actually cause changes within the cell that produce a second message. That's what it's referring here to some ion channels are modified by second messengers, which can cause, rather than worry about intracellular phosphorylation, let's just say that it produces changes in intracellular processes, which really is a series of events that can influence whether or not this cell is going to be excited or inhibited. And again, the here, we're just going to keep it at the surface level. We're not going to go into exactly how all this phosphorylation occurs. We're not going to go into all the protein kinases involved. And you can say thank you if you want to. It's not necessary for a class like this. Okay, here we're back to swan cells, glia cells. One thing I wanted to, this is something I do want you to remember, is that with swan cells, the myelin that they form is, each segment of the myelin is formed by a single swan cell. So, one segment of myelin, one swan cell. And that differs from the oligodendrocytes because the oligodendrocytes, you have one cell that may form a myelin sheath around multiple axons. Here's the cell body of the uh, oligodendrocyte, but notice it's coming out and forming in this particular case, it's forming a myelin sheath around three axons. And it's just showing how the processes coming off of the oligodendrocyte are wrapped in concentric circles around those three axons. It's not limited to three. It's just showing, illustrating that a single oligodendrocyte affects multiple axons, whereas a single Schwann cell just forms one segment of the myelin sheet. And I should just point out in passing that if the myelin sheath is damaged, it's going to disrupt the functioning of the nervous system. Things aren't going to go as they aren't going to proceed as they should. In fact, just a classic example of, of the problems that can be caused by damage to myelin 
If you know anything about multiple sclerosis, that is a disease that uh, attacks the myelin and causes scar tissue to be formed, which in the scar tissue is non-functional. And that produces the symptoms associated with multiple sclerosis. Fortunately, most of us don't have to uh, deal with that. Okay. Now I've talked about two types of myelin so far, I mean of glial cells so far. One, the Schwann cells, the other, the, the oligodendrocytes. There are other types of glial cells as well. And those other two, I'm just going to briefly mention the other two types that we all want to identify. Astrocytes and microglia. And the primary thing I want you to know about these is that um, this table is in your book. It's not a bad summary of functions served by the different types of glial cells. But one of the things that's not mentioned here concerning astrocytes, that's something we're going to be talking about fairly soon is the blood-brain barrier. And if you remember from physiological psychology, the blood-brain barrier is formed by the presence of astrocytes surrounding the capillaries in the brain, and also by what other feature? Tight junctions. Very good. You get a star for that one. Tight junctions between the cells and the brain's capillaries. And then the microglia says perform phagocytosis. What does that refer to? You ever wonder where some of these terms come from? Or how they come up with this stuff? Well, a lot of it's derived from either Latin or Greek. By the way, I was going to mention when we were talking about the important ions, and sodium was Na. How do you get Na from sodium? There's not an N or an A in the word sodium. There's not a K in the past. It's Latin. Latin. Just, uh, the symbols are based upon the Latin terms for those substances. That's why I've often wished, in some ways, I've often wished that as an undergraduate, I had taken one or more courses in Latin. Because believe it or not, it would be very helpful, particularly I mean, in uh, biological psychology and psychopharmacology, but it would be very helpful to people who are taking those courses and just um, general information about anatomy and physiology. And you folks are somewhat lucky here in terms of your science requirements for your degree. In some ways you're lucky, in some ways I think it's unfortunate. The courses you get to select from to fulfill those eight hours or whatever you need for science, I hate the selection they offer. I despise it. Back to those courses, for, I mean, from the standpoint of being a psychology major, from the options they give you, the only ones that to me are really meaningful or would be biology. And when I was at WT, you had a wider selection. And believe it or not, you probably believe it, I used to advise over a hundred students a semester at WT. Every one of them I would advise. They didn't have to follow it. But my advice was take A and P1 and take A and P2. Some of them did, some of them didn't. But at least they had a wider variety of courses to pick from to satisfy the science requirements. I don't really think, I mean, our science is a fine course. I have nothing against it. In fact, I have a pretty strong interest in that. I have a rock collection that dates back to my childhood, and I still add to it periodically. But is that directly 
Is that as closely related to psychology as AMP is? Or basic biology is? Oh well, probably not something that's going to change regardless of how I feel. Okay, we're at the point now where we can start talking about the resting membrane potential. And Cheyenne is just greedy as she can be, but I'm going to put her on hold because we've only got about five minutes left. And I'd really rather not start this topic, stop and pick up the next time. I'd rather finish it once I start. So we'll talk about resting membrane potentials. We'll talk about uh, summation of these potentials. Then we will talk about um, action potentials. And how signals are generated and transmitted in the within the neuron. And at that point, we'll come back and we'll start by selecting to the nervous system, and in particular, it's the solar brain. And Kyla will lead that discussion. Huh. Right, Kyla? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a resounding. I mean, that gives me lots of confidence that you're going to lead that discussion. <laughs> I think maybe in this class with only four people, I ought to just sign each of the topics and say, okay, you're going to discuss this topic. What do you think about that, Abby? Would that be okay? You don't get paid enough yeah. for that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you're getting paid by getting all this valuable information.